Welcome back to Oliver's Insights, part of the Simplifying Investing podcast series. It's great to have you here. A reminder that this podcast is general in nature and hasn't taken your circumstances into account. It's important you consider your personal circumstances and speak to a financial advisor before deciding what's right for you. Any general tax information provided is provided as a guide only. And with that out of the way, here's Shane. G'day everyone. And welcome to the latest issue of the Oliver's Insights podcast. This week, we're going to review something that we looked at earlier this year. And in particular, that is seven key indicators that I think investors really need to keep an eye on in terms of where the investment cycle is going and what shares in particular are likely to do. At the start of this year, we thought shares would have reasonable returns, albeit it wouldn't be smooth sailing given ongoing issues around inflation, interest rates, the risks of recession and geopolitics. So far, so good. But now to those indicators. The first one is one of my favourites. It relates to global business conditions as measured by what these days are referred to as PMIs or surveys of purchasing managers in various companies around the world. And this, fortunately, as implied, is now a global indicator because all countries or all major countries, significant countries, are covered, including Australia. Now, of course, a big determinant of whether share markets can continue to move higher or resume the bear market in US and global shares that started last year will be whether major economies slide into recession. And if so, how deep that is. Our assessment is that the risk of a mild recession is high, particularly in Australia, given the ongoing tightening and the high debt exposure of many Australian households, but that at least a deep recession should be avoided. Now, those global business conditions indicate or PMIs are a key warning of this. So far, they have slowed. They're well down on their 21-2022 highs, but they've actually been quite resilient. In fact, they're still hanging around levels consistent with OK global growth. Down a little bit from recent highs, but well up from the lows we saw late last year. And if anything, they would suggest where we are right now, some upside risk to some of our forecasts. So obviously, they are worth keeping an eye on. So far, so good. Which brings us to the second set of indicators, which of course relate to inflation. Of course, a lot continues to ride on how far key central banks raise interest rates. And as has been the case for the last 18 months or so, the path of inflation will play a key role in this. Over the last six months, the news on this front has continued to improve, with inflation rates in key countries rolling over. US inflation has now fallen from a high of 9.1% a year ago to 3% in June this year. And our own US pipeline inflation indicator, which reflects a mix of supply and demand indicators, continues to point to a further decline in inflation ahead. Now, of course, it's not going to be smooth sailing. There'll be a few bumps along the way. Part of the recent move reflected what you call base effects as high monthly numbers drop out of the annual calculations. And of course, those base effects from the very high monthly inflation numbers a year ago are now going to be less favorable going forward. But by the same token, even the monthly numbers have been continuing to trend down. And our view remains that the broad trend in inflation will remain down, notwithstanding a few bounces. This reflects a combination of lower commodity prices, improved supply, lower transport costs, and easy demand. And of course, easing demand will particularly impact services inflation. Now, just as goods price inflation led on the way up, it is now leading on the way down with services inflation rolling over as well. The Fed is likely to hike once more this month, but the fall in inflation suggests that may be the peak with rate cuts next year. And to reiterate, our US pipeline inflation indicator continues to point a further decline in inflation ahead. Now, of course, Australian inflation is lagging the US by about six months. And that partly reflects the fact that it took us longer to reopen our economy after the impact of the coronavirus pandemic, and therefore it took a little bit longer for inflation to pick up in Australia. But our Australian pipeline inflation indicator suggests that inflation here will continue to fall. The RBA has started to soften its tightening bias recently with comments by Governor Lowe. He remains governor until, of course, mid-September when Michelle Bullock will take over. And while we are allowing for a bit more on interest rates in terms of upside, given RBA worries about still high services inflation and the high risk of stronger wages growth, our assessment is that the RBA is either at or close to the top with rate cuts starting in February next year. And of course, our own pipeline inflation indicator is broadly consistent with that because it points to a further significant fall in Australian inflation. Of course, at this point, you might be wondering what I think of the appointment of Michelle Bullock as the next governor at the Reserve Bank. To be honest with you, I thought there was a role for Governor Lowe to stay on board until he gets inflation under control. But I also understand the government's desire for change. And in that sense, I reckon Michelle Bullock was a fantastic choice. She has the right experience, but she's also a bit of an insider 
which means she knows how the Reserve Bank works. Whereas if you'd appointed an outsider, you would have had a situation there where the new governor would go through a period of getting used to it and establishing their credibility, whereas Michelle already comes in with that credibility built. To be honest with you, I don't think the change will result in a significant difference in the profile for Reserve Bank interest rates and monetary policy going forward. Obviously, changes may come next year with the move to a monetary policy board, but that uh, would have occurred under Governor Lowe in any case. But I think the broad direction for interest rates will remain the same, bit of upside risk in the short term, then down next year. Um, and don't forget that whoever was going to be running the Reserve Bank still has to get inflation back to target, which I think will occur as we go through next year and maybe into 20, 2025. But the broad trend in inflation will be down. This brings us to our third indicator, unemployment and underemployment. Of course, also critical in the issue regarding inflation is the tightness of labour markets, as this will determine wages growth, which has a big impact on services inflation. If wages growth accelerates too much in response to high inflation, in other words, wages just chase inflation higher, it risks locking in high inflation with a wage price spiral, like we saw in the 1970s, which would make it harder to get inflation down. Unemployment and underemployment are key indicators of whether this will occur or not. Now, of course, we all know that recently those indicators have fallen to very, very low levels. In fact, uh, lowest levels seen in decades. In fact, in Australia, the unemployment rate is still around the lowest level in almost the last 50 years. So labour markets right here, right now, in places like Australia and the US remain very tight. And of course, that imparts some upwards pressure on wages growth. And we have recently seen um, some signs of wages growth continuing to accelerate in Australia. But there is increasing evidence that labour markets are cooling. As noted, wages growth is still rising in Australia, of course, with the announcement effect of faster increases in the minimum and award wages adding to this. But wages growth in the US looks to have peaked. And if unemployment and underemployment which is what we call labour underutilisation in Australia, continues to trend up, and so far it's just starting to do that, then I suspect that that will take pressure off wages growth going forward, removing that risk of a wage price spiral. Notwithstanding, yes, I understand the desire of everyone to see their wage keep up with inflation, but the best way for that to happen is for inflation to come down and wages growth to stay around three point something. Which brings me to the next indicator, which is longer term inflation expectations. The 1970s experience tells us that the longer inflation stays high, the more businesses, workers and consumers will expect that it will stay high. And then they behave in ways which perpetuate it in terms of wage claims they put in, price setting behaviour on the part of businesses and tolerance for price rises on the part of consumers. The good news is that short term, i.e. one to three years ahead inflation expectations, have fallen sharply in recent times. And most notably, this is evident in the US. And longer term inflation expectations remain roughly in the same range they've been in for the last three decades. In the US, this is somewhere between about 2.5% and 3%. And right now, that number in the US is 3.1%, which is, yes, at the top of the range, but in the great scheme of things, it's well down from the 10% level we saw back in 1980, which came after a decade of very high inflation. And so the situation today is a lot different to what it was in 1980 when inflation expectations were so ingrained into the system that we required a deep recession in the US. In fact, they had two back-to-back -back recessions. In Australia, we had a very deep one in the early 80s to get inflation back down, which basically tells us that the situation regarding inflation expectations today is far more benign than it was at the tail end of the inflation surge that we th saw through the late 60s, 70s, and into the early 80s. That brings me to the next indicator, which is earnings revisions. Consensus US and global earnings growth expectations for this year have been downgraded to around zero, with a 10% rise expected next year. And for Australia, the consensus expects roughly a 3% fall this financial year in company profits. A recession resulting in an earnings slump like those seen in the early 1990s, 2001 to 2003 in the US and 2008 would be the biggest risk facing equity markets. But recently, revisions to consensus earnings expectations have actually been moving higher. So, so far, so good for that indicator. The next indicator I'd like to look at is the gap between earnings and bond yields. Since 2020, 20, but particularly through 2022, rising bond yields are weighed on share market valuations. And of course, that started to become a lot more apparent in 2022 as share markets fell. As a result, the gap between earnings yields and bond yields, which is a proxy for the risk premium that shares offer 
over holding government bonds has narrowed to its lowest since the GFC in the US and Australia. Compared to the pre-GFC period, shares still look cheap relative to bonds, but this is not the case compared to the post-GFC period, suggesting valuations may be a bit of a constraint to share market gains, as current uncertainties would suggest that investors may demand a risk premium over bonds similar to that seen in the post-GFC period, as opposed to what was seen in the pre-GFC period. Australian share valuations look a bit more attractive than those in the US, though, unfortunately, helped by a higher earnings yield or lower PEs. Ideally, bond yields need to decline and earnings downgrades need to be limited. So valuations are certainly something to keep an eye on right now, as they are perhaps not as attractive as they had been over the last decade. The US dollar, and this is the final indicator I'd like to look at, Due to the relatively low exposure of the US economy to cyclical sectors like manufacturing, the US dollar tends to be a risk-off currency. In other words, it goes up when there are worries about global growth and down when the outlook brightens. An increasing US dollar is also bad news for those with US dollar denominated debt, particularly in the emerging world. So moves in it bear close watching as a key bellwether of the investment cycle. Last year, the US dollar surged with safe haven demand in the face of worries about recession, war and aggressive Fed tightening. Since September, September last year, though, it has fallen back as inflation and Fed rate hike fears eased and geopolitical risks receded. And after stalling in the last six months, in other words, that decline that was underway since last September, stalled in the last six months, it's since broken down again, broken out of the range it's been in so far this year. A further downtrend in the US dollar would be a positive sign for investment markets this year, whereas a sustained new upswing would suggest they may be vulnerable. So far, it's going in the right direction, which is good news. Hopefully, you have found that interesting and that those seven key indicators I refer to are of value and I certainly think they are worth keeping an eye on. Until next time, adios. To keep up to date with Dr. Oliver and the Simplifying Investing podcast series, be sure to subscribe to your favourite streaming platform.